All right. Everybody feeling a little postprandial? <laughs> Planning and execution of femur lengthening nail in 10 minutes. So, you know, it's, it's, this will be a bit of an introduction. Um, patients that are, whose faces are shown have given consent. Um, this is a, uh, an article that we published in JBJS Surgical Techniques on anti-grade lengthening. I think it, it, it's very practical and detail-oriented. And if you're interested, this is a good resource. Um, I'll, give, I'll use this as an example about some basic principles about choosing nail length. Okay, so here's a patient who has a leg length discrepancy of 30 millimeters. When you're using the internal lengthening nail, there is a, it's a telescopic nail, and the end over here has a, we'll call it the, the, the sort of the male end that is sticking out over here, okay? The, as you're lengthening, the goal is to make sure you have the thick part of the nail in the distal segment by at least four to five centimeters, because essentially what happens is it gradually pulls out of that segment as you are doing the lengthening. And it's based on that and the osteotomy location that leads you to choose the length of the nail that you, that you need. But I will say that the, the starters are basically, the goal is to have five centimeters of thick nail. And remember that the thin distal tip is three centimeters, okay? So now, as we plan this, the nail is a straight nail. So if I'm doing an anti-grade nailing, I pick the apex of the natural bow or I pick the apex of the deformity because I need to put a straight nail in. I measure my osteotomy, which is 170. And I use a formula called SNL, shortest nail length, equals the length of the osteotomy plus the amount that I want to lengthen plus 50 plus 30. The 50 and the 30 is what I just told you about. It's the, it's the 30 is what you're starting with. And the 50 is the, is the additional amount that you want in the, in the distal part. So I generally am working with a constant of 80. So the shortest nail length is the osteotomy length plus the amount that I lengthen plus 80 millimeters. Okay. So this is a, a little animation of anti-grade lengthening. I think this kind of, uh, gets us in the mood of, uh, of some, of uh, internal lengthening. It's a very minimal incision technique. We start off, after we choose our osteotomy level, we choose, we make percutaneous drill holes at that point. That's done through a little pinhole incision. Next, um, with a little adduction, we make a small incision and insert a wire into the intramedullary canal. We overream it, we create a little window into the canal. The, can, the canal of a, of a long bone is hollow like a pipe, and we can ream and um, prepare the canal. We generally are reaming two millimeters over the uh, diameter of the nail. So if I'm putting in a 10.7 millimeter nail, I'm reaming to about 12.5 or 13. And then I um, take my nail, and I up, insert it up to the osteotomy level, and I complete my osteotomy with an osteotome. Now, I have put in rotational markers, which you can see at the top and at the bottom, to mark the rotation, because I will then rotate around the nail to confirm that I've completed my osteotomy. If I have no rotational deformity, I make sure that my rotational markers are collinear. If I started off with rotational deformity, I make sure that I have, in, you know, I use that to figure out how much rotation I want to correct. And then you lock it proximal and distal, and you're done. You, you identify where the magnet is. On the, you make a little mark on the skin, and then you start the lengthening process after an appropriate amount of time. So you wait a certain amount of time. That's called the latency phase. Then you distract at whatever rate you want to distract. Usually, it's a quarter millimeter four times a day. And um, the distraction happens gradually, and that's distraction osteogenesis and the callus will gradually mineralize and consolidate. So this, this little animation shows a 30 millimeter lengthening that happened apparently after 30 days. The new bone will gradually fill in and mineralize. Once it, there's an appropriate amount of mineralization, then the patient can be fully weight-bearing. There's no limitations. 
And then usually about a year later, we take the rod out. Taking the rod out is a pretty simple, uh, minimal incision technique through the same incisions with a quick recovery. Okay, so here's a 12-year-old male with a congenital leg length discrepancy. And this is a trochanteric entry for children or patients under about 18. Uh, because of concerns of vascularity of the proximal femur, I'll do a trochanteric entry. Um, and what you can see here is sort of the guts of the nail. Um, that's the magnet. Those are the, that's the amount of thick part of the nail that I want to be over five centimeters. Okay, because as you can imagine, as I'm lengthening more and more and more, that thick part of the nail is pulling out of the distal segment. And what you don't want is the junction, right? You don't want this junction to be right in the middle of this new bone. And my goal is to have at least five centimeters. Sometimes you have to compromise on that a little bit, depending on the situation, but that's my goal. And that is regenerate, right? That calcified, that what you're seeing there is about four to five centimeters of regenerate bone. And when you get to that point, the patient can be full, full weight bearing. A uh, year later, the nail comes out. The bone has remodeled nicely. Okay. The, um, this is a patient who presents with medial-sided knee pain. Oops, wrong lecture. <laughs> so the patient has, you know, went to the knee doctor, was going to get a, knee re a partial knee replacement, but... The, the knee doctor was a good doctor, took a good history, found out that he had a malunion, had a leg length discrepancy. So it turns out the patient has a one inch leg length discrepancy and has this big extra articular malunion. So you can use this kind of technology to deal with a situation like this as well, because we have two problems now. We have malunion with angular deformity, but we also have uh, length discrepancy. So we do our analysis and we decide we're going to make our osteotomy. This is this is uh, anatomic axis planning, because which is really what you need to do when you're trying to figure out where you're going to put your nail and and how to get a nail across each intramedullary canal. Remember, it's a straight nail. My my distance is very important because again, I'm using that in my SNL, my sh uh, shortest nail length analysis, to figure out the shortest nail that I should be using is a 255. Now I can go longer. And so my plan is to use a, uh, a nail that is greater than 255. Now, intraoperatively, I want to correct this deformity, but I want to do it in a minimal incision technique. You can apply uh, external fixation in the operating room and use fixator assistance to do this. It's a biplanar deformity. So I've got fixator pins placed out of the path of my future nail, percutaneous osteotomy, correct the deformity, use the fixator to provisionally hold it, pass the nail, identify the magnet, and we've straightened out the femur. Now, we gained some length, but he, did, he needed some additional length. That's why I used a lengthening nail as opposed to just a solid nail, because I really wanted to get his leg lengths perfectly equal. And so that's what it looks like after consolidation. He still has a little bit of varus, which is related to his knee arthritis, and... So we went back and did a proximal tibia osteotomy and comprehensively took care of the whole problem. But another application of, uh, and I think we did that at the same time that we took the nail out. So it's another application of where you can use uh, the internal nail to lengthen and correct malunion. Retrograde internal lengthening is, uh, is another approach. These are good resources. This is another good resource. For, uh, for this technique. Uh, their indications for a retrograde are pretty much if you can't use a, an antegrade or if there's deformity in the distal femur. That's probably the most common uh, uh, indication I showed you after hip replacements and stuff like that. Locking screws are a, to, a very uh, important technique for helping to correct deformity when you're doing retrograde distal femur lengthenings. Fix it or assisted nailing is the other. So this, these two techniques, which we have sort of borrowed and developed, are fixator-assisted nailing, locking screws. That's what you need to really get the job done. So what do I mean? Here's a woman who has an LLD and a growth arrest, so she has a valgus deformity, okay? My planning is such, you know, I'm correcting 11 degrees of deformity. 
for me to correct that deformity, that nail has to come in in a particular angle in the distal segment. So it's about the starting point and it's about the direction of the nail and the blocking screws are what's necessary to help me plan that technique. And so the blocking screws are placed, the fixator is applied, the osteotomy is done, the acute correction is then done, the deformity is corrected, then you can then ream for the nail, then you can insert the nail. And so now deformity is corrected and then you do the gradual lengthening with the internal lengthening nail. So you, again, you accomplish correction of deformity and, um, and uh, leg length equalization. You can see really nice callus formation. Uh, and again, you can see the, this is the magnet, these are the gears, and this is the amount that the rod has distracted. Um, and occasionally, and that doesn't come up that frequently, we will use a sort of a bifocal technique. And here's an example of a, a 20 year old male with congenital short femur and fibular hemimelia untreated with a total discrepancy of 51 millimeters, and he's got valgus deformity. When you start analyzing this problem, you can see that the LLD is split between the femur and the tibia. There's deformity in the tibia. There's no deformity in the femur. So rather than doing it all in the tibia, which is one way to do it, I decided to do half in the femur and half in the tibia, right? So the tibia is going to be about correcting deformity and lengthening. The femur is going to be about straight lengthening. Done at the single stage. Femur lengthening, pretty straightforward. Tibia lengthening, fix it or assisted blocking screw technology. Okay, right? The blocking screw is helpful and important for correcting that valgus entirely and guiding the nail. The other important detail for tibia is you have to have um, FLSS, floss screws, fibula length stabilization screws at the top and the bottom so that the fibula moves along with the tibia. We achieved equal leg lengths, the healing noted in the femur and the, the tibia. Now again, if you look carefully at the tibia, I think you can appreciate that minus this blocking screw, the, this would, the deformity wouldn't have been fully corrected. So the use of blocking screws uh, has been very, very helpful. Sometimes a little confusing to figure out where the blocking screw goes, but uh, there are guidelines and um, it's probably beyond the scope of this lecture, but there are guidelines for really understanding where to put the blocking screws and how to utilize them. We are using similar case, in, but here using some of the advanced uh, PAX planning techniques where we do the virtual osteotomy and then implant the virtual implant and, and confirm that we have realigned our mechanical axis. So it's an, this is kind of the current way that we're doing a lot, of this, a lot of this planning. And then this allows, you know, you can really look at it. You can say, where am I going to put my blocking screws? What's my translation going to look like exactly? And uh, it kind of simulates you're almost doing a virtual operation before you go into the, uh, into the OR. Thank you.